When we hear the word prophecy, we think of Old Testament because a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament definitely foretells what's coming ahead. Wednesday nights, we're, we're learning through the teaching of Dr. David Jeremiah on where do we go from here in our culture, and our society. And I want to invite you to be here Wednesday night because it's end time prophecy. And people say, well, okay, what's the difference between prophecy and fortune telling? They both talk about the future. And you know what? You're absolutely right. They both foretell the future. And you say, well, how can that be? If you go to the Old Testament and when Moses went before Pharaoh, the magicians were, were able to do exactly what Moses was able to do. They copied. And let me tell you, the enemy is not a creator. He is an imitator. And so when you, you know, I think it's funny because when you go to Branson, such a family Christian atmosphere, and in the middle of Branson, there's this little store, it's a gas station, right beside the gas station, it says, Psychic Palm Readings. I'm like, how have they been in business in Branson, Missouri for so long? Because even in the brightest places, and even in the most positive places, the enemy will try to bring darkness. And so as we look at the light about the prophecy today, it is foretelling. It's not fortune telling, but it's foretelling to what is going to take place, what is going to happen. The difference between fortune telling and foretelling or prophecy is simple. Who's behind it? You see, prophecy is divinely directed and spoken to a man, through a man, by our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. Fortune telling and just reading palms and Ouija boards, there's a different spirit behind that. And so we have to understand that. And so prophecy is telling the future or foretelling, but it's the spirit that's behind that. And it's always for our good. Do we benefit from it? Definitely we benefit when we hear the word of prophecy and we heed to it, but it's from our Heavenly Father. Now, in fact, today as we look at the prophecy of light, it's interesting because this past week we started Advent. It's called Everyday Advent, and I hope that you have been a part of this. And if you haven't, go to your email. If you haven't signed up for our email to get these uh, uh, Advent devotions, please do so. Because today you'll receive the second devotion for this week. This past week was the first week of Advent. And if you, you know, the tradition is, is that you light a candle for each week of that. And this past week, um, last year was the first time that our family actually sat down and, and I bought an Advent kit, if you will, and, and had it shipped. And, and we, we, we lit the candles every week and we just reflected on the Word of God and on the devotion. It was really a, a really neat time for our family. And so it's interesting because the first candle that was lit this past week is actually the prophet's candle. It means hope, and it goes right with our message today, and so I want you to understand that God is trying to tell us something. I didn't plan that. In fact, when, when I was looking at Advent and I was reviewing my notes, I'm thinking, God, you are so good because you're bringing everything together today. The prophet's candle. And what it was, it, it was the prophet who would bring the message of the coming Messiah. There was an expectancy and a hope to the Jews that their Messiah, their Savior was going to come. And that's why we celebrate and focus on Advent beginning this past week and up until Christmas time because once again, Jesus has come, but how many is excited that we know he's coming again? He's coming again. And we have hope in that. And so today, as we start the second week of Advent, we need to focus on the Word of God. And we're going to look at a man today that, that was not only prophesied about, but he was also a prophet. His name's John the Baptist. John the Baptist. We're going to read in John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and then verse 15, as we are introduced to this prophet named John the Baptist. A little bit different guy. If you know anything about John the Baptist, he ate different things, he dressed differently, he even spoke differently, but he was a prophet who was prophesying about the Messiah and the light to come. So as we do each week, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read our passages of Scripture and honoring the reading of God's Word this morning. John chapter 1, we're going to read verses 6 through 9. And then we're going to skip down to verse 15. You can either read it on the screen or in your Bible, in your hand, or in the notes. Beginning in verse 6 of John chapter 1. God sent a man 
John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. Take note of that. Everyone might believe because of his, John the Baptist's testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Skip down to verse 15. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds. This is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Are you ready to hear the word of God and allow it to change your life this morning? Can you pray that with me? God, let your word change my life today. Come on, let's pray it together. Lord, let your word change our life today. As we hear it, as we, as we digest it in our spirit, may we hear the word of God and apply the word of God and do the word of God. Lord, help us, help our testimony illuminate the darkness because we are sharing the light of Jesus Christ. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There are a few lessons that I want to take from this man named John the Baptist. And when we were, when I was looking at this series and we were talking about it as a staff, honestly, I was automatically, like many of us do, when we hear about the prophecy of Jesus Christ, we mainly go to the Old Testament, specifically to Isaiah. But as I began to ponder on it and meditate and pray, I felt like the Lord directed me to the New Testament, to John the Baptist, because I believe that his assignment and our assignment are really no different. And so there's a few lessons that I want us to learn this morning from this man, John the Baptist. The first lesson that we see in our passage of Scripture this morning is that he was sent by the maker of light. He was sent by the maker of light. Now, if you go back to John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word already existed, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created. Everything, including light, was created by God. John the Baptist was sent by the creator and maker of light because look at verse 6 God sent a man John the Baptist you can't get much more plain than that he sent a man John the Baptist John was a man he was a human being he was chosen by God he was sent by God he was sent to give a prophetic voice to the Jews about the coming Messiah now that word sent in the uh, original language Greek in the New Testament it literally means to send out, to commission as a representative, as an ambassador, sent towards a designated goal. It's the same assignment that you and I have as followers of Jesus Christ because he said, go, <laughs> I am sending you. It's the same word. We are being sent out by the maker and creator of light. John was designated by God to be that voice crying from the wilderness about the light before he was even born. Now we go back to the Old Testament and Isaiah. In fact, Isaiah shares about John the Baptist, but then it's confirmed in the New Testament. I want you to hear your pastor this morning. You cannot separate Old Testament from New Testament. It is one complete book. And so Mark, he, he refers back to the prophet Isaiah in Mark chapter one, verse one through four, and he's speaking about John the Baptist. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Look at this. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, and this is what the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said about John the Baptist. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Verse 4, the messenger was who? John the Baptist. Now I want you to catch this because Mark is referring to Isaiah, the words of the prophet. But then Isaiah says that his voice, he is a voice, look at this, shouting. Shouting in the wilderness. If you go back to our text, it says in, in verse 15, John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds. 
John the Baptist was sent by the maker of light, and he was fulfilling his goal even by the way that he proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah. He believed it so much, he was wanting to get somebody's attention that he shouted. He was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. You see, after Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, there was no prophet until John. It was silent. It's called the silent years, where there wasn't a voice from God speaking it was a quiet time when no one heard the voice of the Lord. And there was a 400-year gap between the Old Testament and the writings of the New Testament. And John would bridge that gap. He would bridge that gap from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The promise of its fulfillment and the anticipation of the Messiah and his arrival. And it was the answer to all the hopes of the Jews. There's three things that are true about a man who is sent from God, and it doesn't only apply to John the Baptist, but guess what? It applies to you and me. Come on, let's look at them real quick. The first thing, and you may want to write these down, it just simply is the person who is sent from God, he belongs to God. He belongs to God who has sent him out. You don't belong to anyone else. You belong to God. As God sends you, you still belong to God. Secondly, he was commissioned to be sent out. That's what that word sent, what we read in our passage of Scripture. You are a representative. You are an ambassador. And thirdly, he possesses, and this is wonderful, he possesses all the authority and power of the God who has sent him out. You see, you not only belong to the maker of light, you not only are commissioned by the maker of light, but how many things for you have all the authority and all the power of the one who said, let there be light. John, John was sent out the creator and maker of lights and you say well pastor how does how does that apply to me it's simple as you leave this place this morning and you go out into your mission field whether it's a workplace whether it's a school setting whether it's it's a uh, you know wherever you may be you can look around and you don't have to look very far until you see people living in sin and living with a hopelessness in their life and just like john we are sent to speak light into the dark world that is around us. You see, John's goal was that all men might come to trust Jesus Christ, and that needs to be our goal as well. I want to encourage you this week to slow down. I want to encourage you not to be in a hurry, and it's so easy during this time of season. We're already a society and a culture that is going from one meeting to the next conference call to the next Zoom meeting, and we're not taking time to be sensitive to those who are hurting and that are lost and that don't have Jesus around us. And we have an assignment because just like John the Baptist, you and I have been sent out to proclaim to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah to those who are living in darkness around us. You see, that should be our goal as well, just like John the Baptist, that all men might know Jesus and trust him. But not only was John the Baptist sent by God the Father, the maker of light, but he had an assignment. And we learned what his assignment was by learning the second lesson from John the Baptist. And the second lesson this morning we can learn is that he was willingly, he willingly shared truth truth of the light. Look at verse 7 through verse 9. To tell about the light, that was his reason. That was his purpose. That was his goal. To tell about the light so that everyone might believe because, look at this, of his testimony. Not of his mom's, not of his church's testimony and involvement in the community, not of his parents' Not because he went to VBS or he went to Sunday school or he went to life group or, or he went on a mission trip. No, 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 no. He wanted people to believe in Jesus Christ because he lived as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, let's ask ourselves a question. If people are following me 24-7, am I reflecting a life that would want to make them follow Jesus Christ? Are my actions like Christ? Are my motives that of Christ Jesus? Even my speech, what comes out of my mouth, is it to build up? Do people hear the way I talk and say, you know what, they're different? Or do they hear the way I talk and say, you know what, there's not much difference between you who go to church and us who don't. And John wanted everyone to come and believe in the Messiah because of his testimony. 
his testimony. He was sent for the people's benefit, to be an additional pointer, if you will, to the true light of Jesus Christ. And people are in sin today, and they need to see someone. They need to hear someone that will tell them the truth about the light of Jesus Christ. And John's goal was, and we just read it, so that all men, so that everyone might come to trust Jesus. Is that your heart's desire? Is that our heart's desire as a church? That the 17,000 people that live inside the city limits of Salem Springs and the 36,000 people that live within a 10-mile radius of Salem Springs, is it our desire that because of our testimony and our belief in Jesus Christ, do we truly want people to be saved and become followers of Jesus? Well, if we do, we have to talk like it. We have to act like it. We have to live like followers of Christ. That's not a very popular message today. Because we are called to be different. We are called to talk different. We are called to walk different. We are called to think differently. And the only way that we're going to do that is to get into the Word of God and follow the manual for a believer. It's that simple. That's why we believe in biblical teaching and preaching and worship. Because I want my life to reflect the cause of Christ so much that someone that doesn't know that I'm a preacher, doesn't know I'm in ministry, they will look at my life and go, you know what, there's something about that guy. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but he seems to be content. He seems to have a joy in the midst of chaos. He, there's something different. That's my desire. The same as John's. Share the truth about the light. Our, he's now our national, our general treasurer of the United States of the Assemblies of God. Alfredo, Wilfredo Chaco de Jesus, he goes by Ch Pastor Chaco. He wrote a book called In the Gap, and this is what he says about John the Baptist. He says, John's job was to get people ready for Jesus. He called them to repent, to take stock of their lives, realize they were sinners, and turn to God. Repentance is a message of change. It's a response to God's searing light shining on our darkest sins and when then humbly ask, acknowledging that we need his forgiveness. That's what the truth of light is all about. When you accept Jesus Christ and the truth of that light comes into your life, you change. I don't live the way that I used to do. I repent and turn from our wicked ways and follow Jesus Christ. Today, it's being preached that as long as you say a prayer, you can live however you want to because God loves everybody. Part, part of that is true. God does love everybody. But he loves us too much to leave us the same. He wants us to have life and life to the full, not a foolish life. And we have to understand that John the Baptist was so willing to share the truth of light, and that's what we have to do. Well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Well, it's time that the church speaks truth, and if it hurts feelings, so be it. Jesus made people upset. He hurt feelings, but he loved people too much not to share the truth of light with them. Speaking truth is not always popular, but speaking truth is always the right thing to do. And Christ gives light to every man. This doesn't mean universal salvation or general revelation or even inner illumination. It means that the light comes into my life and shatters the darkness. It gives light. In fact, that word gives light, it, it's really, originally it's the word that we get the word photo from. And, and it's interesting, when I was in high school, I worked at a drugstore. Some of you will remember this. Some of you will think that I read this in some kind of book. Uh, you know, I'm making it up. But there used to be a time that you didn't have all your pictures on your phone. How many remember that? How many remember the Kodak 110? And they weren't, the photographs weren't left on your phone, they were left on the film roll. Come on, how, how many goes back to the days of, you know, take, I mean, especially Christmas time when we were moving our parents up here to Salem Springs. And I remember growing up, there was a, buff, a, a, a buffet uh, a, a, that had drawers and everything, and, and, and they still have it. And I remember my sister, and we would open up those drawers, and there would be all those little 110 canisters with film on it. 
Some of you watching and some of you here this morning, you're going, what is film? And there used to be a company called Kodak. And I remember working in this drugstore, and this is revolutionary. I walked in, and the owner of that drugstore, he wanted to get into the business of photo processing. There used to be a process. It used not be instantaneous. I remember if we wanted to take that 35 millimeter canister, those little round tubes that the 35 millimeter film came in or the 110, we would go down to the local drugstore because back then Walmart was not worldwide. You'd take them to the drugstore and you'd fill out this envelope and you'd drop the film can can Come on, am I talking to anybody this morning? <laughs> you drop it in. Right? Come on. <laughs> Some of you are going, Pastor has lost it. He's talking about film and licking his thumbs. No, you'd lick the envelope, stick it in, and you would wait. You would wait for your pictures to get back. What do you mean you had to wait? Sometimes seven to ten days. But then... On the scene comes one hour photo processing. <laughs> it still wasn't on our phone. And so Ray Lackey, the owner of the drugstore, he thought, you know, I want to get ahead and I want to do one hour photo processing. So he ordered the machine, they went to school and learned how to open up those canisters and there was this large beast of a machine it was probably at least half the size of of this platform front and i remember on one end you would you would put the canister and you put the canister in and it was the dark room it was where you couldn't let the the film be exposed or it would run the film and so there were sleeves that you would put on and you would go in and it was all by touch and they would open up the the film canister that had the film in it and they would roll it out, and, and then they would get it to where, and then they would put it into the next part, and then they would, they would put it in some solution and let it stay in the solution. And it was only after that solution was in there for a moment, then they could take the film out, and so, depending on your exposure, how many remember the different exposures? You had 12, 24, and if you had the money, you could take 36 pictures on one roll of film. Because they charge you per picture to develop. And so at the end, they would hang up the film, and you could see it. It was called negatives. Not because they were negative. I don't know why they called them that. But you would hold it up to a light, and you could see the images in that. And then they would take the negatives and they will run them through the end part of the machine, and with the right adjustment of light and color, on the other end, it spit out photographs. Amazing. That's exactly what happens to us. Yes, we are instantly saved when we say that prayer, but it begins when we're in the darkness. And the Lord's hand begins to mold us and make us. And then we're, we're, you know, there's sometimes that you try to expose yourself to things that you're not ready for yet. It's a process. We've lived in such an instant world that we have forgotten that discipleship is a process. Some of us are being molded and shaped even in our darkness, but the hand of God is getting us ready to bring us into the light and to develop us into what he wants us to be. That's where this word sent out comes from. In fact, it gives, it gives light. It means to illumine, to enlighten. And so Jesus came to develop us. He came to give us light while we were in the darkness and John shared the truth about the Messiah coming, and the people responded. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 4 and 6. This is, this is, none of us have any reason. Some of us use the excuse, well, they may not listen to me, or they may not like me. Well, I'm, I'm not educated. I don't, I don't have the right clothes. I don't go to the right places. Listen to this. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. How many has that in your closets? 
You have some clothes that look like camel's hair. You need to get rid of them. And do not donate those. All right? Just get rid of them. Here comes John, this prophet of one that's calling out in the wilderness about Jesus and Messiah. His wardrobe is wonderful, camel's hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. Now, I can get that, but it's not like the leather belts that we had. And then look at this. His food was locust and wild honey. Only part of that is something that sounds decent. I wouldn't even try chocolate-covered locusts. I, I mean, I'm a chocoholic, but I'm, I'm like, I just can't get it. So we have a man that doesn't look right. He doesn't look normal. He doesn't dress normal. He doesn't even eat normal. But yet, look at this. Verse 5, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Look at what happened. They came to this wild-looking man, this non-normal-looking man, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So you and I have no excuse for not sharing about the truth of the lights. Because I don't see anybody wearing camel hair, and I doubt if anybody's having locusts and honey for lunch today. You're pretty normal. Come on, look at somebody that you don't think's normal and tell them, say, you know what? You're normal compared to John the Baptist. You're normal. Now, uh, it's interesting. We had water baptism today, and this is exactly what John the Baptist was doing because baptism in, in, in the original language means to dip or immerse, submerge into. That's why we submerge people in the water because that's what John the Baptist did for Jesus. And John's baptism was called the baptism of repentance. He told them, I will baptize you with water, but there is someone who's coming after me that will baptize you with fire. John's baptism was a public showing that I have, I have repented and I am outwardly declaring what has happened to my sins. They have been washed away. But I want you to look. He says that not only I baptized with fire, in Matthew 3 and 1, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. So in John the Baptist day, someone who repented of their sins and say, I'm turning to God, they would go to the Jordan River and he would baptize them. It was an outward sign that repentance had taken place and someone was making a change in their life to follow God. Same thing we're doing today. All the baptism candidates that came up, they made, they made, they have asked for forgiveness, they're following God, they're following Jesus Christ, and they wanted to outwardly express to you what has happened in their heart. That's exactly what took place. But, John says, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. Look at this. And he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. You say, well, what's the difference? Water baptism shows what happens on the outside and affects on the outside. Spirit baptism happens on the inside. Water baptism happens from the outside in. Holy Spirit baptism happens from the inside out. John couldn't help someone's heart and fill them with Holy Spirit and fire. Only the Father God, only Jesus Christ can do that. You see, sharing one's faith, evangelizing, is a core practice that we should practice and not just talk about and not just think about. For the Christians, for Christians, it's viewed as a mandate from Jesus Christ himself. Go into all the world. Make disciples. Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Start in Jerusalem. You see, that is a mandate from Jesus Christ himself. And yet, it's something that's not taking place much here in the United States when it comes to Christians. In fact, today a number of factors are, are curbing many Christians' enthusiasm about sharing their faith in Jesus Christ with others. Including, one of the things is the declining of Christianity in America. And COVID has accelerated that so much that today I was talking to Dr. Van Dyke at the Cafe for a Cause. And he said, Pastor, is it true that, that, that after COVID that church attendance has been cut close to 50%? People coming to church. And I said, I wouldn't doubt it. As I sat around with pastors from across the nation this week and a few weeks before at an Acts 2 meeting, 
It's the same thing from East Coast to West Coast. We're seeing it in churches today. The apathy of coming to church. I understand everybody needs a vacation. I understand everybody needs a day off. I understand people get sick. I understand that sometimes you're working seven days a week. Sometimes you work on Sundays. I understand that. But I'm telling you, there is nothing like being in the house of God with the people of God worshiping the Almighty God. There's nothing like it. I'm not against online church. I'm thankful for those who are watching today. But nothing, there is not a substitute for what you get when you come together with believers in Jesus Christ. I see people a lot of other places besides church, but they can't come to church. Let me move on. Jesus baptizes the person in the spirit and in fire. He dips, immerses, and places that person in the spirit. And so John says, I, I baptize you with water for repentance, but there's someone coming. There's some, he's sharing the truth about the light. There is someone coming that won't just baptize you in water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire so that you can proclaim the truth of light to other people. Yet today, it's declining. In fact, faith sharing is falling out among believers, but especially younger adults, even religious younger adults. There was a study that says that practicing Christian millennials, 47% believe that evangelism is wrong. 47%. And the younger they are, the higher that percentage goes up. Now, some of us here this morning, we've been raised in church. We know about evangelism, but we can't, we can't get too, too uh, we can't look too much down on the younger generation because we may believe in evangelism, but we're not doing it. Come on, y'all were shouting a while ago when I was talking about being in church. So there's not much difference between a millennial not believing that we should evangelize and those that should know we should be evangelizing and we're not doing it. So my point is, I'm not knocking the younger generation. In fact, the younger generation are probably evangelizing more than the older generation is because the older generation says, well, I've done my time. If you're breathing, you still have time. You hadn't clocked out of this world yet. And what I'm trying to do is say it is all our responsibility to share the truth of the light of Jesus Christ. George Barna, who founded the Barna Research Group for years, has done specific research on the church, what's happening in the church. He's a great researcher, but I've only gone to one of his conferences Because those who keep up with statistics and are great researchers, you don't want to sit through their conferences. You nod off. But this is what his research found. There was a report conducted with Dr. Mary Healy, uh, who is the professor of scripture at a university called Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. And this is what she states. Many people in our time are affected by a kind of spiritual numbness. Beginning from childhood, they've been overstimulated, overscheduled, overindulged, and overexposed to sexual content. She continues, they've been taught that self-fulfillment, sexual, sexual freedom, and economic success are the highest values. Wow. That's our generation today. So, they often seem to have lost interest in the most important questions of life. Why do I exist? What is my mission in life? And how do I fulfill it? What is true love and how do I find it? These are questions that they're not asking. In fact, she goes on, she says, many people today show indifference to these deeper questions. But no matter what, those questions are still beneath the service. And she notes this. There's no replacement for a real encounter with God's power and the holiness of his people. You can't substitute being in the presence of an almighty God. That's where we need to put our highest value, being in the presence of the Lord. And John was speaking, preparing people for this truth. He says the truth is among us. The light is here. We need to be sharing the truth of light about Jesus Christ We need to pray for a deep desire. How can I share my faith? 
How can I not overschedule? How can I not uh, be overindulged? How can I not be so self-focused that I push out those that are hurting and need to hear the truth of the lights? The third lesson is simply John the Baptist willingly submitted to the light. He was sent by the light maker. He shared the truth of light, and he submitted to that light. In fact, look at verse 26 through 30. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. Did you know that Jesus baptized people? That's who he's talking about. It wasn't just John the Baptist, but John the Baptist, his followers said, hey, that guy that you're claiming to be the Messiah, he's on the other side, and he is also baptizing people. And look at this. And everybody's going to him instead of us. It sounds like church competition. And John replied, look at his reply. Verse 27, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom. And he gives this imagery that they could understand, especially in that culture, in that context. He says, it's, it is the bridegroom who marries the bride. The bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. In other words, it's not the best man who gets to marry the bride. It's the best man who's able to stand with the groom and cheer him on and be excited for the wedding. That's what John the Baptist was saying. But how can you have that kind of attitude? He wraps it up in verse 30. Simply put, he must become greater and I must become less and less. That's my prayer every day. Jesus become greater and greater, greater and greater. He must increase and I must decrease. You see, without realizing it, John the Baptist disciples were putting him in a situation of competing with Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And they were saying, whoa, 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 hold it. Some of our disciples are starting to follow that man that you call the Messiah because he's baptizing. They're leaving our church and going to his church. And John says, you know what? I'm not the Messiah. I told you that before. But I am here to tell you this one truth. I am here to tell you this one truth. He's the Messiah. And for him to become greater, me to become less, that's my goal. That's my desire. And so my prayer for us as believers in Christ Jesus, my prayer for us as the assembly in Salem Springs is that we become less and less and that Jesus Christ becomes greater and greater and greater. That people see him and not us. You see, it's easy to forget where our talents and abilities come from because John the Baptist shares the most basic principle of where it all begins, and he simply says this in verse 27, no one can receive anything unless God gives it to him from heaven. Everything you have and everything I have comes from, from above. And when we understand that, it's easy for me to become less and less. We were driving along this past week, and I was, we were talking about Someone asked us, we, hey, on vacation, they said, they said, Gary, are you, are you, a, you know, where do you like to spend vacations? Do you like the beach or do you like the mountains? And I said, I prefer the mountains. I love the mountains. I said, I don't mind going to the beach. I mean, that's fine. I said, I prefer the mountains. I said, Crystal enjoys the beach. Kind of the same thing. She, she likes the mountains too, but, but she enjoys the beach. And we were talking this past week, Crystal and I, I said, you know, I said, the, the ocean, anytime I'm around the ocean, and anytime I'm around the majestic mountains, it just remembers, it just reminds me of just how small I really am. It's amazing. It's amazing. You say, well, I don't know if I can go to the Rocky Mountains. I tell you, that's even happened here in the Ozark Mountains. You go to Hawksbill Craig and you just sit and you look out over that vast valley. You go to Devil's Den and you take a small hike. You drive along just the majestic mountains that are between here and Alma, Arkansas, and I-49, and you just pull over, and you just stop, and you begin to look at the creation and what God has given to us, and it will make you feel less than this. And He must become greater, and I must become less. It's easy to forget where our talents and abilities come from. 
We need to turn it to God. J. Hudson Taylor was being introduced by a pastor in Melbourne, Australia. And as pastors, he began to introduce J. Hudson Taylor, great missionary. He began to use a lot of different superlatives, which one was great. J. Hudson Taylor, a great minister, a great... And he used that word several times. And when Hudson Taylor stood up in the pulpit, he just quietly began his message with this. Dear friends, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. Wow, the only greatness that we have is anything that he gives to us so we can become less and he can become greater. There's three things that are in first or in John. I call them the three musts, and then we're going to close. It's a simple outline. The first is the must of the sinner. John chapter 3 and verse 7, you must be born again. You must be. As a sinner, we must be born again. And then we see in John chapter 3, verse 14, we see the must of the Savior. The Son of Man must be lifted up. He must be lifted up. And so you have the must of the sinner and then the must of the Savior, that he be lifted up. And then thirdly, in verse 30 of John chapter 3, it's the must of the servant of you and I. Verse 30, what I just hit on. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. So, Father, that's our prayer today. John the Baptist gives us these lessons that we are sent out to share the truth willingly as we submit to Jesus Christ, as he did. Help us to do that beginning this afternoon. I want to have you stand across this congregation I want you just to close your eyes. John the Baptist was not only a prophet, if you will, but he was an evangelist. If you continue reading in the New Testament, especially in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. It's not just for John the Baptist. It's not just for the evangelist. Timothy was a pastor. He says you must do the work of evangelists. And God still uses man to evangelize man. John gave witness or proof of Christ Jesus so that all men, through his testimony, might be saved. So I'm going to ask you two questions this morning. The first one is simple. Do you have the light of Christ in you? Because you cannot share what you do not have. Is the light of Christ shining in you? You say, I don't know. It begins there. And you have to respond and say, Jesus, come into my life because I want your light to not just shine in me, but I desire your light to shine through me. It begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you will convict, convince those that are in this room and those that are watching online they need the light of Jesus Christ they need to repent just as the people following John the Baptist they need to repent they need to be baptized as we saw today and they need to turn and follow you if you're here this morning you say pastor that's me I want you to lift your hand right where you're at say I don't have the light of Christ in my life but I want that light that's where it begins all across this place just lift your hand and look me in the eye so I'll know that that I saw your hand If you're watching online, if you wouldn't mind, in the chat box, just just share your prayer request and your desire in that chat box with our hostess this morning. 